You're listening to STEM Essential, an Iowa Governor's STEM Advisory Council podcast. Hear from leading advocates and voices about why STEM education is crucial for our world today and tomorrow. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jeff Weld, Director of Iowa's STEM Council. STEM is Iowa's and our nation's economic development initiative, where education and economic development merge to improve lives and communities. The voices of leading edunomic developers are heard on this podcast, today featuring Dr. Mark Putnam, the 21st president of Central College in Pella, and member of the executive committee of the Governor's STEM Advisory Council, who also serves as chair for the president's group of the Iowa Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, among two dozen organizational leadership posts he holds, all while making time for blogging under the title, Mark, My Words. Thank you for joining us, President Putnam. It's a pleasure, Jeff. Glad to hear from you. Well, let's begin with a revelation. Tell our STEM community something that few would know about you that had a profound, but maybe a subtle impact on your own professional path or your current practice, making you who you are. Well, I was never expected to go to college. Uh, When I was growing up, it was not a part of uh, my family's thinking. There had been nothing in my path that would have set me on that course. And I was really set in a, in a educational pathway that was about just going to work after high school. Uh, and as a result, I didn't have a lot of STEM education, uh, growing up. My math direction quickly became business math and accounting and my science uh, direction did not take me on to chemistry and physics. So uh, I majored in philosophy in college, which is probably the last thing one would expect uh, for a kid who didn't uh, anticipate going there at all. And it wasn't until I got into graduate school and I was going down a path uh, in my doctoral program where I knew that I had to, to really get into economics and finance at a level that I had never done before. And I didn't know what to do because I lacked the math background. So my wife was teaching at the time, and she had a colleague who was was teaching uh, high school math. Uh, And so we connected, and for about four weeks, maybe five, uh, I sat in her classroom, eighth, ninth grade classes, really. And uh, she tutored me in getting back into what I needed to be able to handle economics of education and financial decision making. And as I... uh, took time with her. I was sitting next to a couple of students in her class who were staying after to do some additional work. And it was in one sense a humiliating experience. And in the other sense, it was the most rewarding experience I've ever had. Uh, I did well in that economics course. And then I went on and did applied uh, uh, regression analysis and statistical inference and things that I never thought I would possibly be able to do. So I'm really sympathetic to people who feel that they can't engage in things related to STEM. And my story is one that says, oh, yes, you can. And more about your story. I want to dig in a little bit to the first generation collegian, because I think people like you by that circumstance are going to be very interesting to listeners. I, I've heard legend that sometimes it's, it's the girlfriend or it's a parent who wants better for the child. There's there's a force that had to have exerted itself somewhere around middle school, early high school, by which you adopted the college-bound pathway, unlike everybody in your family tree. What would have taken place in that age 14, 15 range that put you on that path? Mr. Herb, uh, I was, I'm guessing 10th grade, roughly, and I was passing in the hall. And he said to me, have you thought about going to college? And it had never been asked of me. Uh, And he said, come and see me. And we sat down and talked a bit. And then he put me through a battery of tests of just interest and things like that. And uh, it, it opened a conversation I never understood because a school counselor took a moment to stop me in the hallway. It never ceases to amaze me, I'm sure you and everybody, the power of a teacher's comment, a moment in time changing your life path. That's right. Well, let me shift to the topic of the day. You're invited to the podcast to speak on higher education STEM. If you don't mind, share with the listeners why this topic should matter to everybody. Why should people care 
about STEM in higher education today? Well, in the broadest context, I think STEM literacy uh, is about citizenship. And especially those of us who work in small liberal arts colleges, citizenship is a big theme for all of us. So I think it empowers people to engage, to be present to important conversations. It informs things like uh, voting activity. It informs how people are engaged at work and the possibilities they have. So sort of the base level is that an educated citizenry is what we're all aiming for in the long run. I think that's a big part of it. But the higher education lens is particularly crucial. I sit in this most interesting seat. What happens in my life is that I have parents and students who are coming through high school who look at me and they say, what is it that they want? referring to employers, particularly, or, or graduate or professional schools. What is it they want? And can I do that? And can you help me get there? And then on the other side, there are the employers or the graduate or professional schools who receive our graduates. And they say, what are they like? Are, are, they, are they engaged and interested? Are they eager? Uh, w- will they be good contributors to our success? And there's some times that I, metaphorically I look at it saying I'm, I'm, I'm nothing but a facilitator of conversation between uh, parents and, and their children and what they're talking about and how we engage in a narrative through time that positions them for the experiences they're going to have after college, whatever that, that might be. Uh, what's so fascinating is that the, the parents and the students often think that it's something that it's technical knowledge alone, you know, that I've got to be able to to manipulate information or data, or I've got to be able to do a skill or a task of some kind and, and do it effectively. And really what employers say to us all the time is, are they curious? Are they are they interested? Are they engaged? Are are they good are they good workers? Do do they want to do things important in life and achieve great things? Uh, So facilitating that conversation is, in a sense, the role higher education plays in translating it, taking uh, a young person who has lots of ambition and interest and moving them through a set of experiences, the knowledge, the skills, the experiences they need in order to be effective in those contexts in the future. It's a lot more than math. It's a lot more than simply scientific understanding because it's a mindset. It's a self-awareness. It's an awareness of others. It's awareness of the world into which they are placed. And so the holistic notion of education embraces STEM because STEM is in a sense systemic, but it's part of a bigger educational narrative that I think is so important to what society needs in the future. The president as the translator So you preside over a distinguished liberal arts institution, which under your watch, I've I've, uh, known personally, you've advocated strongly for the expansion of STEM programming at Central College. How do you balance the the, the liberal arts and, and the humanities and the STEM thrust and keep all parties feeling like they're your number one? Yeah, so I, th- I think it's about the integration of things. There was one time years ago, Someone who's an engineer was was talking about working with engineers and saying, you know, I really don't care if they understand Dante. I want to know if they can design. And I said, have you, have, have you ever seen the Inferno? You know, it, it's the, the notion that that the metaphors, the ideas are really important. One of the fascinating things for me as a, as a president of a liberal arts college is where our graduates end up. 86% of our students, no matter what their major is, end up working in business. And, and so what we find with employers is that they very much want people who have a broader understanding. So we think too narrowly too often. We think that when it comes to software design, we, we simply need people who can handle the math and who have the program training and can code and, and design systems like that. But what really happens is you need to understand the user interface because we are humans. How do humans engage this this information? So that's where psychology and anthropology and sociology bring to light a different understanding of what technology means in various settings. I hear it constantly from employers. What they're saying all the time is that they need both. They need people who understand the way that work exists in the world, how people engage and encounter it, 
how they advance with it, how they can be creative with it. That's a much bigger conversation than, than simply what happens inside of an equation. Mm. And what a timely conversation, human engagement in this uh, virtual context we find ourselves. I know, in fact, I'm gonna bring your blog up in, in this light, in this context. Mark, the, the theme of the podcast is current conditions and future outlook for STEM. I was reading a recent blog post you wrote about planning at the speed of change. That might've been the title. And you had this nugget that I'm going to quote. Quoting now, substantive change emerges slowly, even though it feels like it is thrust upon us quickly. Ironic given our times, I, I, I know you are opining on our times. My question to you is, our STEM community is seemingly changing substantively and fast. How would you characterize our current condition, especially in the light of uh, substantive change emerges slowly when we're in this frenetic head spinning rate of change seemingly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we, we tend to overestimate short-term trends and underestimate long-term trends. Sometimes we call that the tyranny of the urgent. You know, we see what's in front of us and that we don't project it, extrapolate it in a way that helps us to understand what the long term effects are. And so we could draw a conclusion right now, given the experience we've had through this pandemic period, that this is going to change everything, that education is in a classroom is dead. And I've actually read people who were saying that kind of thing, that we're never going to have that again. And, and I find that what's the most interesting is they're not talking to students. Uh, they're talking to each other in conference rooms and, and looking at screens and, and reading articles by people who are not kids. But, but the students are, are finding in great numbers now that, that they miss the fact that education is fundamentally a human enterprise. So the miss on something is, is to say when we look at, at the short term, this kind of disruption, the kinds of conclusions we draw can be very, very different. The substantive change, in my view, is a reclaiming of education as a human enterprise and understanding where it needs to be, apl be applied and in what contexts, and then the, the long-term trajectory that, that that creates. So there will be changes in technology. There will be educational design that shifts, pedagogical changes, instructional technologies, all kinds of things will shift based on what we're experiencing now, probably enhancements, frankly, and, and how we support learning. But the, the substantive piece of this is much deeper, that the Mr. Herbs of the world matter a lot. Mm -hmm. So as you wind down the semester at Central College in this upheaval condition we all find ourselves in, innumerable modifications have been made in the STEM departments of Central College in particular. The hands-on lab experience has been suspended. And you're, you're band-aiding, I'll use the phrase, you're band-aiding to get students to the end of the semester in, in a momentary crisis or upheaval. People talk a lot about a new normal. There's no going back to what we once knew as normal, but I hear you saying, no, there will be a return to a normal. There's not a new normal. There's, a, there's an upheaval condition we find ourselves in, but this, the model that Central and so many higher education institutions are built upon will prevail. Yeah, and uh, higher education assimilates. And people have, have for, for hundreds of years indicated that all of higher education is going to change as we know it. The radio was going to do it. Television was going to do it. Video recording was going to do it. Computer technology was going to do it. It doesn't change the fundamental nature of human to human contact that brings learning to life because you need the Merlin experience. You need someone who is present helping to sort and to bring pattern and understanding and wisdom and seeing it as something greater. You need the interpreters, the facilitators, the guides, all of those those works and, and um, the ways we enable learning are really, really critically important. And so what, what I see in this is that the technologies that support learning are always evolving. And they become, in some cases, even more elegant and, and facilitate an awful lot. But I have yet to see in my career, and I have been promised in my 36 years, that we were going to fundamentally change higher education as we know it. It has evolved. We have assimilated many things into the classroom and the studio and the lab experience. But some things haven't changed. 
and I see no evidence that, that they will. Students are dependent learners when they're in kindergarten. They're 100% dependent. Uh, they're taken by the hand. They, they're learning colors. They're learning numbers. They're tying their shoes. They're telling time on the clock. They're, they're starting to learn letters and shapes and forms. And all the way through, the journey of education is to gradually lead the student to independence and in learning. Brain development is not complete until after 25. So what we, what we have to understand is that it's a process that unfolds. And the four critical years we talk about with undergraduate education, often it is the moment. It is the moment where someone begins to emerge as an independent leader or, or learner, excuse me. We see it all the time because the student who came in as a first year student and was asking, do you take off for spelling and is that gonna be on the test? Are suddenly arguing with faculty members over some issue that they put into an honors thesis. And, and it becomes much more of a colleague relationship as they're pursuing it and, and developing things. That's the miracle. That doesn't happen because we're checking boxes in a computer system. That happens because people have been adaptive and changing and growing through time and becoming an independent learner. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you've heard since the beginning of your own career, 36 years of uh, advice that college is going to change fundamentally as we know it. And yet, fundamentally, it's not. It's the, 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 the accoutrements and, and the tools and the strategies evolve. But the, the nature of the organism with whom we work is still a human being with the same uh, sort of uh, needs and, and brain functions and uh, if you wouldn't mind imagining 36 years out from here, and I ask you each of these questions embedded in a context of STEM, uh, you were told early on in your own career that uh, 36 years ago, you were told colleges are going to change fundamentally as we know them, and yet they haven't fundamentally changed. What do you say to those coming, the young Mark Putnams of the world, 36 years from now, what kind of predictions do you have for them? What college, what STEM at higher education might look like? Uh, never major in a job title. I, that's the first advice I give people, and it is probably the most violated uh, of anything else because they're trying to think about economic success. And routinely, as I talk uh, to the employers, the, the graduate professional school leaders, they're saying how quickly things are changing in the world around them. And so what I say to students often is that they should major in the department I chair, which is called adaptation. Uh, and I, I actually take in everybody who is truly clueless as, as my first students, uh, because what, what they have to understand is if they think they can predict exactly what is going to be present, then, then they're misunderstanding reality. Uh, and that's only accelerating at, at this point. So uh, when we think about, uh, you know, if you had said to me uh, years ago that if, if I could have been a web designer, I would have thought you wanted me to be Spider-Man. Right. That's all I would have. I wouldn't have had any frame of reference for what that even meant. And the people I'm talking to are saying half of the positions they have right now uh, didn't exist 20 years ago. And in 20 years, half of the, what's now here won't be won't be present either. So when we look over the horizon of a young person's life and imagine how many times they're going to have to adapt and change, if we think teaching them a methodology of some kind in the moment is going to be real. Imagine a scientist, this, your own background and interest, before there was DNA sequencing. I mean, how much fundamental change occurred in science because of that, right? So now we're talking about nanoscale, and, and the, the, the changes in the future are going to be breathtaking and, and what can come. So a static world notion for people is, is the most threatening, and that's the idea of majoring in a job title. They have to find a way around that and realize that they're going to be learning and adapting and growing and changing forever. So going on a trajectory that understands that if all we have done in higher education is prepare a student for his or her first job, we have failed. We've failed miserably. What we have to be able to do is to prepare them for that entry and get them on a trajectory of change, change management in their own lives where they can adapt and grow. And this adaptation capability on the part of higher education institutions puts a significant um, burden of opportunity upon faculty and administrators who are preparing citizens for adaptable, un unpredictable futures. How do you... How do you accumulate such a squad of uh, 
faculty around you who uh, embrace this idea that it's not what I know, it's how we know and what we can and cannot know, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental understanding of the limitations, something that we might refer to as intellectual humility. Uh, about how much has shifted. I'll never forget years ago, um, probably it was in about the early 90s, and um, a faculty member I knew at an institution uh, I was talking with and didn't seem all that old to me and and said he was retiring. And I said, really? I'm kind of surprised that, that you're retiring. He says, well, I can't use a computer. And I've taught chemistry all of my life um, without a computer and I'm not prepared to do it. I can't I can't do it I'm obsolete and there's nothing riskier than that right and so faculty members are constantly having to retool themselves and to grow and develop and 20 years ago we used to be really worried about faculty adopting technology uh, because so many of them had not had that background depending on the disciplines they were in and, and of course, the big joke in those years was that, well, students will teach faculty how to use the technology. And there's a little bit of truth in that. But faculty, uh, even those who are much more senior uh, these days, have become exceedingly facile with, with uh, using technology and growing and developing. Because they've been forced to be novices, they've become learners again. It's been the most remarkable thing I have watched, is that when you force someone to become a novice, they relearn. They become a student again, and they're suddenly a better teacher. Uh, that sounds like a Neil Postman book from uh, the 1990s about assigning novel subjects to teachers every now and then to keep them humble. Mark, uh, what do you consider some of the greatest threats looming over us uh, between this present, this crisis existence we find ourselves in momentarily, and this vision of STEM education, education 30 years from now, this unknown brave new world where learners are equipped to adapt and to pivot and to be agile and to apply what they learn and to communicate and collaborate. Uh, what are the maybe three top threats you monitor that we should all be monitoring so that they don't derail this wonderful vision for the future? Well, the first thing that comes to mind has been laid bare by uh, this pandemic situation, which is inequity. Uh, I think it's absolutely remarkable what we are seeing just in the health effects, but in the societal, economic effects, et cetera, uh, that, that having this division in society is going to be very seriously problematic uh, to the extent that people like to fo focus on a workforce as it relates to STEM education. Uh, the wake up call here is that we need to be much more broad based about fundamental education about the, the building blocks on which we have to, to, to press the future forward. And that, that's, that's a real big issue for us to manage. Uh, I think also, uh, you know, we've got to, in, in that context, understand that human difference and diversity is something that we have to build toward and, and, and grow and develop our, our approaches for. Uh, because if we don't get broad participation, there will not be the workforce there in the future in any way. Uh, we don't have the fertility rates that we had years ago. Uh, and so birth rates are down. Who knows what this crisis has, will do? The, the Great Recession produced a very clear and obvious decline in birth rates. This pandemic might do the same. Who, who knows? So the long-term horizon with fewer people means that we have to do much, much better job, far better job of educating and preparing people for citizenship, certainly, but also for various roles that, that they can play. And then, you know, other things like immigration come into the, to the fore as well. Uh, how do we welcome talent into the communities uh, that, that we want to grow and, and develop through time? Uh, so all of this starts with early age and if there's one thing that I have been motivated about in the STEM Council, uh, which people will probably be surprised by, is that the, the fundamental work of the STEM Council is not about higher education. It's about lower education. Uh, it's about the early years and developing the pipeline. It's still the case nationally that only about 15% of the students who finish high school take a course in calculus. Uh, and yet we imagine that we're going to have an enormous pool of engineers and, and, and people who can handle that level of work. Uh, but the disconnect is profound when we, we look at how many students aren't achieving at the levels that are necessary. And the reason is it gets hard. Uh, you know, when you're young, STEM is all about play. And it's, it's about fun and it's about interesting things and, and learning stuff like that. And then math shows up. 
uh, and and getting people to those places and growing them through those places to have the Merlins of educational experience say you can do this. Uh, you can make it possible. That's that's the kind of thing that we have to overcome that right now I don't think is in, in uh, a sufficient form. Yeah, I think you're you're well aware that uh, the American mindset among teachers and sometimes students is you've got it or you don't, right? The growth mindset is a journey that we're on and we're probably in the early stages of that journey. So, Mark, you kind of paint a picture that the pandemic exposes uh, ills in the system, gaps, weaknesses in the system. So these are the threats that uh, you foresee. Let's turn that then to opportunities. How do these exposed weaknesses, gaps, um, inequities translate potentially into opportunities for STEM in the future? Uh, so societal resolve may be the biggest hope we have. Uh, you know, you, you think back to what it meant when JFK said a man on the moon by the end of the decade. You know, so the moonshot concept, of course, it was, you know, it was coming out of the Sputnik era. It was coming out of World War II. There's a lot of momentum building and, and advents of, of new technologies being considered that, that were pretty profound. That had a lot of impact on young people's ambitions and ideas. Uh, you know, what would it be like for us? What opportunity would be present if, if we talked about uh, system-wide public health, about sustainability, about the opportunities to preserve society long-term? That's a mission worth living for. That's a mission worth, you know, putting energy uh, forward for something. I, I think it's pretty vapid in the end for students who are talking about getting a job and earning a living. Uh, most students I talk to while they, they care about their economic success, they also aspire to something beyond themselves, that life is more about their own or more about the, something more than their own interests. And, and to me, that's, that's what this could be turned into, is to say the world needs you to step forward uh, because a generation of people are going to need to rise up on life sciences right now, on, on healthcare right now, on medicine and allied health fields right now. Uh, in order for us to build into that future. And, and so perhaps what physical science has benefited from during the space programs, real growth and development, this situation could become something profound in the life sciences that, that could be absolutely breathtaking. Yeah, I think that's uh, a great hope, a certain awakening of the conscience. Mark, let's end on a high note, you are naturally a, a positive, optimistic person I've come to know, and, and so many have. Share with us something you've, you've done lately or something that you heard, something you read, something you saw, or something you came to just realize that inspired you about STEM education in Iowa and, and across the nation, for that matter, uh, from your vantage. So I have, I have these wonderful moments um, in my life, and it's... Uh, it's the privilege of, of sitting in the chair I do, uh, but there are occasions when I, I get to be an observer or a participant in something that students are doing. And uh, the, the college here has uh, a research symposium routinely, right? And it's been displaced by the current situation but each term, students who are engaged in undergraduate research, and there's just you know stacks of them who are involved in these things, and it, it ranges from humanities to social sciences and a lot of science, of course. Uh, and they do poster sessions, and then all the campus is invited in, and then we wander around and they they present their posters and and talk about their experience. And likewise, we have honors uh, theses that students are presenting, and those are open to the campus to to participate in. So. Uh, not long ago, I was at one of these events, and I I stood and and listened to a student talk about uh, an undergraduate uh, research experience in chemistry. The reality is that I understood very few of the words, which first of all impressed me, right? And what I what I watched with such pride, with such a admiration of the student, was uh, how he was just passionate. I mean, he couldn't he couldn't believe he had the chance to talk about this and, and that he was describing these, these big wide eyes and, and 
great, great big grand gestures and, and pointing to the poster. And I said, that's why I do this, right? That, that's, that's what this is about. And so STEM education, when we think about its full impact, is about igniting. It, it's it's about trying to create an accelerant in people's lives where they see the possibility in what they're doing. And and so I can at the same time see small kids, uh, you know, Central College has adopted the third graders at Finley Elementary in Des Moines. And so from time to time, I have occasion to spend some time with the third graders, either on our campus or up, up at Finley. And watching them and these, it, it's the same energy. Their eyes are wide, their gestures are grand, their, their sense of ambition is present. And, and so the hope I have when I look at all that is to say, if those third graders can grow into that college senior who's just confidently presented to me on a highly professional level, that's the miracle of education. And so that's why I work. That's what I do. Why I do what I do is to be present for those moments of self-discovery, self-awareness, but of broad application where these students are going to be incredibly impactful in the workplaces, in, in the educational settings, in the community settings they're a part of. And they're what will, they are the ones who will bring life and health to everyone around them. Well, your passion is contagious. I have no doubt it spreads across Central College. Dr. Mark Putnam, president of Central College, thank you for sharing your compelling vision for STEM with Iowans and our partners across the country. Pleasure, Jeff. This has been episode three of STEM Essentials, a podcast series featuring the voices of edunomic innovation brought to you by the Iowa Governor's STEM Advisory Council. Thank you for listening, and please join me next week to hear from Emily Wilkerson, majoring in chemical engineering at Iowa State University, who will share what it's like to pursue a STEM career. Today and all STEM essential podcasts are available at iowastem.gov forward slash podcast. Thank you for listening to STEM Essential. This podcast is generously co-sponsored by Collins Aerospace and MidAmerican Energy, proud partners of Iowa STEM Council. To learn more and find resources, please visit iowastem.gov.